All right, Miss Corinne, just say your name. Corinne Air Cannon. My name is David Stan Yunus. I'm records archivist at the Presbyterian Historical Society. Uh, today is June 27th, 2019, and I'm with Corinne Cannon. Corinne, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, would you begin by just telling us a little bit about your early life, where you were born, your parents and family? I was born in North Carolina, near in Huntersville, near as North Carolina, that's near Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I'm the daughter of Emania C. Lytle and Rosie White Lytle. And uh, your father and your father and mother, what was your father's profession? He was a farmer mm -hmm. and an entrepreneurial. And this was um, this was nearby Canapolis and the No, the it was near it was near um, Huntersville. I'm and sorry, that was Charlotte. in the, uh, in Charlotte in this river. At that time Canapolis was very young, just being organized but a young town. Well in fact a young community at that time. But uh, my father was a farmer. He had a about 196 acres of land out in the Mecklenburg County, Mecklenburg and Cabarrus counties. And there was a lot of, uh, I had a lot of relatives at that time. And it was called, uh, our church, we were, were, we weren't Presbyterians at that time, my mother was. She was originally from the Cedar Grove Presbyterian Church in Cabarrus County. And so, but my father was a M.E. Zion, very active in the M.E. Zion Church, and so we were brought up. My, my siblings and I, we were all brought up in the in the two denominations. Uh, was the, How does that work? It works good because if you was the Presbyterian, no matter where you go, you'll always have that Presbyterianism. And I hate to say ism, but it is. It's a, it's a part of you. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, a, like I said, a large community at the time. We called it the Lytle Grove community. The L in my name stands for Lytle, L-Y-T-L-E. And we had our own school in our community, which was Lytle Grove School. And I, I can remember when the Rosemore School, if that was a kind of school that was used in the South for the Afro-American children that stood out by Rosemall. I don't remember the initials, what was the, I've forgotten what Mr. Rose, the initials were at Rosemall. And I had uh, sisters were teach, that were teaching in the Rosemall School, had several in the county of Mecklenburg and Cabarrus mm -hmm. County. And, uh, but I went, I went to high school in Cabarrus County, which was Corn Court, North Carolina. Concord, okay. Logan High School. At that time, it was a young high school because that was something new for the Southerners. And uh, uh, you didn't, we, you, a lot of the communities didn't have high schools. Yes. But there was one in Logan. It was a created school. Yes. After high school, what were your future plans like? Well, I planned to maybe go on to college and get a doctor's degree and all this, but other plans came up. I got married, and I had a very good husband and a good marriage, and I rose, raised family, my family and quite a few other people's children. I worked with children for many years. What was your husband's name? Esau, E-S-A-U. Cannon. C A N N O N. Yes. And he was an identical twin. He had a twin brother's name, Jacob Cannon, Esau and Jacob. They were named Jacob and Esau? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a heavy handle if you're an identical yeah, twin named yeah. Esau. 
Just carrying the names for them. Yeah. And if you read the stories, it made you remember them. Yeah. Did that affect his personality or demeanor, you think? Yeah. He carrying did. that weight? Yeah. Well, it wasn't too heavy, but it was, everybody knew the Cameron twins. Yeah. They were identical. Yeah. Jacob and Esau, what was, what was Esau's profession? He worked in the textile with Cannon Mills. Okay, Mill. so now we're at the Cannon Mills. Yeah, we're back to Cannon Mills. And so you were married and you and Esau moved to Kannapolis? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You said you raised your own family and many other families. Many other children, right? Um, I worked with the kindergarten department in the churches. At that time, a lot of the parents had to go to work and they bring the kids, children by my house. And I used the church, which is next door to me, as a kindergarten place. Mm -hmm. And quite a few kids that, I, that went through my hands. Mm -hmm. And the, the church that you were a member of in Canada? It's Covenant. Covenant Presbyterian Church? Mm -hmm. Canapolis. And just so that I know what decade we're in <laughs> at this point, um, when when did you and Esau move to Canapolis? We we got married on November the nineteenth, nineteen thirty eight. We moved to Canapolis on November the twentieth. 1938. Get ready at morning about 11 o'clock. What was that moving day like? Well, taking my suitcase out of the car and putting it in the <laughs> You were, yeah, you were traveling late. Traveling late, traveling late. We did, we were building a house and we had one room completed. So we could go in and the other completion went on that same. And continue to get in the house finished. I lived there 18 months and moved across the street, right across the street from where I was. That was, that was left as the home house, for the Cannon home house. Okay. And I moved across the street, and I've been there ever since. I've been in that same house. And I got the house that was completed in May 1940. The the Cannon Mills in the 30s and 40s, so the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression of the period is that during that time, a lot of the mills from the north, like in Massachusetts in particular, um, were kind of transferring operations uh, to the south um, to, uh, to avoid using union labor in the North yeah. and to exploit the kind of underpaid wage yeah. level of black labor in the South. Yeah. What was life like for Esau in the Cannon Mills? Well, the establishment at that time had it so that it was on the level. It wasn't any different. Uh, we didn't have the union. The, union, the Cannon Mill property was owned by private people at that time. It was uh, mostly by the Cannon family and uh, the, the Davos and the other people. Because it was until about 30 years ago that we, before we ever had a, a city. Hmm. It was always just a community. Well, Cannon Mill was, at one time was one of the largest textile uh, companies in the nation during this time. And uh, there were uh, thousands of people working because they had three shifts. And uh, the chances for Afro-Americans at that time weren't very good because they had to take the many or work. It wasn't productive. In fact, I was the first Afro-American woman to ever work on a productive job in Canada. I was going to ask, we, um, we have an oral history taken with, uh, with Katie Cannon, 
mm -hmm. um, from the 80s where she lifts you up as, um, you know, she tells a little bit about your story as um, one of the first African American women to I work. I was the first. You were the very first. Very, very first. Yeah. And you worked, what was your job at the Canaanites? Well, I worked in uh, the spinning department, and unless you would know what I'm talking about, but I ran a machine, a warper machine to get the yarn ready to spin to make mm -hmm. the material for the sheets and the linens that were being made at that time. Mm -hmm. How long did you work there? Uh, well, in fact, I, I was really getting there. Of course, the way the situation was, you know. And I worked, um, I had all, all of my children were here. And uh, I worked, I started working in, uh, I believe, 63, uh, 1963. And I worked, and I had my mother with me and uh, my children. So I just, I didn't work quite 15 years, right at 15 years, I worked regular. But I never did, I never did a really quit. I just told her I'd be back when the situation that's my mother phase. And then before I got back, well, other things, they were all getting in school. And everybody got in through college and all of that. I was getting to be a nail and a lady again, so I, everybody, when I, I got the last one in, in the college, out of college when I was. Yeah. Tell me, um, I don't know the uh, birth order or ages of your children. Can you run them down real quick? Let me see, the one would be, what did I say, 80, 80, uh, 80, I'm gonna say 80. I think I'm right. 79 or 80, something like that. Give his name. Who's the, then, who's the old, what's the name of your oldest child? The oldest child, child is James Ernest Kevin. He is a granddaddy of uh, Nick, Nicholas Scott. Of Nick, okay. Mm -hmm. He's the grandfather. He has quite a few other sons. In fact, one of the baby grandsons graduated this this may pass from Harvard University. Okay. Javen College, yeah. Congratulations, they're in order. Uh, who's next after James? Oh, I'm about to forget that. Of your children. He's Esau Levon. Leave on, I'll yeah, leave you away. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Who's next after you? Sarah Elizabeth Fleming, Cameron Fleming. Doris, Corinne, Canon Love. And so Katie Geneva is fifth? Oh, I forgot Katie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sarah, Sarah. Uh -huh. After Sarah was Katie Geneva Cannon. Okay, she's fourth. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Doris. And then uh, at a foster daughter. Oh. Yeah. With Se uh, Sylvia Moon Win. W I N. -N. Wow. What was. Uh, and then Jan John, John Wesley. John Wesley? Mm -hmm. John Wesley is another foster child? No, that's my child. Oh, John goodness Wesley. gracious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jerry Lytle. Okay. Yeah. Is that all? Mm-hmm. 
there, uh, there's certainly a special place in heaven for mothers, and mothers of seven children <laughs> have some special room there. <laughs> What was, what was it like? How far apart was the spread between James and Jerry? Eight years, ten years, twelve years? Twenty-five. Twenty-five years? Yeah, he was, mm. Jerry was born in an uncle. Jerry was Johnny James and she was already married. Goodness gracious. After high school, Jerry, James and she went to, um, in service, military service. He married while he was in service, and um, so Katie grew up right in the middle of it. She was in the middle. Big, big she used that for an excuse. <laughs> excuse for what? Well, it is not. But well, you know, it's not my fault. I was in the middle of it. I didn't get as much time. She said she didn't get as much time as everybody else. <laughs> she told that in school a lot of times. She asked her to say she, she asked her, well, true. I didn't know that she wasn't getting the time she was supposed to. <laughs> but she, she did. She used it. She said, she said that to Katie that, that, that Sarah and Doris got more attention. She was always saying that. It was, we have a very happy family. Mm -hmm. This is my, that's my, that's Miss, that's Miss Wynn over there. <laughs> what was school like for the Cannon children? Well, it, I think it was very good for them. They all went to, they never, my children were, that was my husband's main reason and purpose for living to educate those children. See, they got an education because he was not that blessed. His parents were sharecroppers. And if you, I, I know you read about how hard it was for a lot of sharecroppers. I was blessed to be in a, just a little better circumstances than my family was because they were uh, landowners. And uh, like I said, That's right. entrepreneurs working and having something. We were born up being salespersons. For about 50 years, I was referred to as the people in the both counties as the Avon lady. Mm -hmm. I saw quite a bit of Avon. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so, Katie Geneva went to the public school in She went to public, public school, George Washington Carver High School mm -hmm. in Kannapolis. And, then and after that, she went to Bob Scotia in Concord. And after that, she went to uh, ITC and uh, Georgia here. She was blessed that she got scholarships. She met, she went cum laude at most of uh, the She was a straight A student. And from that, she went to Union in New York and got her doctor's degree there. When, when she went off to Barbara Scotia, what was that like for you? Well, it, I looked, looked forward to it. My, great, my grandparents, my grandmother, was one of the first graduates from, from it was Scotia Seminary at mm -hmm. that time, you know. And so it was like a landmark for us. In fact, it was just about 12 or 15 miles from my house, so <laughs> they were expected to go there because it was, but with that many children and the eight, their ages being so close together. See, Kate was born in 1950. Dice was born in 1951. And uh, Sarah was born in 1948. So that was three, right? Yeah, all three right together. Mm -hmm. But Miss Wee and Sylvia went to Spelman. She came down here. We were all getting everything getting grown in. Oh, Sylvia had to go to Spelman. So I brought her to Atlanta after graduating from Carver School. They all graduated from Carver. Um, George Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. Carver High School, Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um,
at, so you were close enough when Katie was at Barbara Scotia to stay in touch a little bit, or was it one of those yeah, things where yeah. you get a little bit away from your parents in, just in order to get freedom and come Yeah, well, they had, the, they had the freedom, but I saw them about every week. Mm -hmm. One minute a week, so I didn't. They weren't even at home with me. Canned boxes of food, pies, and cakes, and things. Mm -hmm. And so Katie was there, uh, I guess, between 68 and 72? Yeah. Sarah graduated in 70, I believe. Katie was next. Um. There is, there was a recording I think done in um, 2008 where the church interviewed Katie um, about the experience of being a college student at Barbara Scotia mm -hmm. on 4th of April 1968 mm -hmm. when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Um, did, did you and she talk about that experience? You know, I mean, she would have been a college freshman and. Yes, she, she enjoyed being at Barbara Scotia, and she was Miss Barbara Scotia for one year, and she did a lot of different other things. She talks about having a kind of political awakening in the 60s. Yes, mm -hmm. that was during the time, she was there during the time of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's movement. Yeah. And, uh, with a lot of the changes that were going on in the... Yeah. Um, was there other kind of political or cultural ferment in Kannapolis at the time? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. Everything was segregated. Of course. And uh, naturally, there would be political problems. Mm -hmm. there, were a lot of, there was a lot of tension going on. Um, I'm, I'm also from the South. My, my high school did not integrate until 68, so 14 years after Brown v. Board. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's high school didn't integrate until 1970. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was the, that kept us from a lot of the things that was not exposed to they have American children. Tell me more. Well, it was a separate and very unequal. I think that's what we said instead, separate and equal. Very unequal. No comparison in a lot of places. Yeah, yeah. Kannapolis itself is, uh, is that an almost entirely black community? Well, yes, I, and see, all of the schools, all of the churches, all of the properties, and everything was, was not really owned by the canons. Mm -hmm. But it was, since we did not have a union, and let me, I'm going to try to make it plain for you to see, but the parental care was there. And it wasn't like that you might be uh, thinking it was different when I say parental. But the schools, there were times in, during the before cigarette for integration, when the school system for Cabarrus, Cabarrus County, and Kannapolis City School Board have never been together. Okay. See, the Kannapolis is in Cabarrus County, but they have the Cabarrus County school system, and they have, but J. W. Cannon was the old was a, that was the older Cannon, one of the, one of the older Cannon. But Charles Cannon was really the ones that uh, uh, was in charge of the churches and the schools there. And any time that money was needed, rather than having you with the, with the union, we went to Cannon Charles Cannon paid, at one time, paid the teacher's salary. Oh. Hmm. Mm -hmm. so and all the, all, the material, all the schools and all the churches, the mainline churches, were owned. Canon property. It wouldn't have. 
so Charles Cannon's philanthropy for the schools and churches yeah. was kind was of in the, lieu of paying union wages? Well, not in lieu of. You got your wages, but uh, they were minimum, mm -hmm. live above a minimum. And if there were other, other, if other needs, you could always depend on the can. This is probably going to sound like we left. He's left. He left. He died in. Um, I'm not sure the year. April the first. I know. I can't think of the year. Right now, but when he died, it was a Cannon Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
When was Jerry ordained in Catawba? Oh, what year was what year did we get into? Uh, that's when the churches were. What church? When, when did? When was the New Orleans? When were they all? There's no more Southern, no more. Uh, it's 1983 was reunion. Yeah. Well, it was only that. I think it was. Really. <laughs> so the Cannon family has had an imprint on the life of the Presbytery, of that one all-black governing body. And uh, Jerry's already been the moderator of uh, Charlotte Presbytery, and he stays on quite a few of the committees. In fact, I work with Presbyterian too. I think I went to General Assembly about, I've been about eight times. Wow. Represent. What was your first General Assembly? My first General Assembly that I attended was in 1961 at uh, San Antonio, Texas. What were the major issues that first General Assembly? The same as today. We had racial issues. We had a uh, Sexual, the sexual issues. Mm -hmm. It was and, uh, sexuality. Everybody was. We've always had that. I mean, some of the issues that we studied more about now in the church were the same ones that we have always had. A lack of money and. Placing of the budget and all of those kind of issues that we had then and we still have. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the way the church addresses those issues has changed in 50 years? Are we doing any better? <laughs> Are we circling around? <laughs> okay. Uh, have you seen the General Assembly? address those issues differently, 1961 compared to like 81 compared to 2001? Yes, I do. I see that they address it differently, but I don't see, I really don't know. I can't speak for the for okay. that group, but personally, I don't see much change in what we do. We are, we're losing, really, I've been here for a long time that we were losing members, but I know now we are losing a lot of our members. Um, so you've been to four General Assemblies? I've been to eight. Yeah. You've been, I'm sorry, eight? I've worked on different levels from committees. Mm -hmm. When we used to have the Board of Nation Missions in 475 Riverside Drive, mm -hmm. I was on that committee. I attended all the meetings that we used to have all over the place. Okay, so you were on the um, the governing committee of the, of the Board of Nation, Board of Nation okay. Mission. Got it. You said you've been a, a commissioner as well as serving? Yes, I've been commissioned about yeah. three or four times. Yeah. What was the most interesting committee you were on? What was the name of it? Caesar says, you know, that the, the farm thing. Caesar Chavez? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was on that committee. I met with those people. That was when it was in. Where, where, where's the Alamo? Is that San Antonio, that would have been maybe 71. I'm looking it up for right now. Wait, let me see. Oh, uh, San Antonio was 1969. And that was it, where? That was in, uh, I'm in Chicago. Oh, I was a commissioner in Chicago. Uh, San Chicago Antonio. was 70. And I went to Baltimore. I was a commissioner in Baltimore. Okay. And I went to Atlanta. I went to Atlanta on my own. I think that's the only place I went that I wasn't. I mean, that I took my own stuff. I came down here to Atlanta when we were going together. Okay, you were at Reunion in Atlanta. I was at Reunion. So you met with Cesar Chavez in 1970 in Chicago? 
Yeah, I believe that's I believe that's what it was. You know, unless you have I have my notes in it, it, the house somebody so just out of my head sometimes I get things together. That would be great. Uh, we would we're very committed to um, helping preserve the story of your family. Um, and if you have uh, notes and personal papers available, like we would love to bring them in and make them accessible to researchers. That's just a blanket offer if you're comfortable with it. Um, do you remember um, uh, Do you remember anything about um, the committee's work with Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers? We still, it was extended the same thing. We gave it all the committees. And I don't know if anything was really changed from our um, meeting. Personally, I'm talking personally, there might have been other things that I didn't know about. But I know we always had those issues of the farm workers and everybody was being oppressed at that time. Was, it was being brought up at this general assembly. But now where the difference made, I couldn't say. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare say that. Mm -hmm. I, I keep talking about the 1970 General Assembly because um, we had... Hey, it's all right. <laughs> um, we, have, um, we have motion picture footage of the 1970 Assembly. Um, and there were, there were extensive interviews done with youth delegates in seven. Yeah. And there was a kind of... I mean, call it the Yeds, I believe it called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the church was very much interested in kind of addressing the concerns of the youth of the day. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so it's, it's kind of a, a focus for us, especially since we're coming up on um, uh, 50 years since the 70 assembly, you know, 2020, Baltimore, like you say, we're going to be dealing with many of the same issues the church was facing in 1970. Um, so, so yeah, hearing, um, hearing that the church was attempting to bear witness to the struggles of the farm workers mm -hmm. in 1970 um, it seems to have historic resonance today. folks migrating north and being detained in concentration camps and children being torn from their parents. Um, so you've been involved in the church at many levels. Um, you've been a commissioner at the General Assembly. Um, how long have you been involved with the National Black Presbyterian Caucus? The first time I think I guess it was in '61. Usually when we had dinner, you know, it was always a, a day or sometime we had a meeting during that time. Uh -huh. But then uh, Jerry was uh, when we were in Philadelphia, I believe. What year was that? It's been a couple of times in Philadelphia. The last time it was in Philadelphia that I know of. Okay, it might have been 1989. Ah, that time. Like, yeah, we all went up to Philadelphia. That's when Jerry was the president, Jerry Cannon was the president. Mm -hmm. So you've been involved with the Black Caucus so since I've about been, I've been, Yeah, I've been into a lot of the meetings since then. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what brought you into the caucus and what does it do for you? Just anything I've about if it's good, I don't mind being involved in it. So I couldn't just say what brought me into it. Mm -hmm. But I've been in the Presbyterian Church ever since, 19, active in 1940. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a matter of choosing it. No, You've it's, been just, it's just been chosen. Been asked to serve on committees. Never didn't know how to say no. And mm -hmm. we used to, uh, during the Presbyterian women, United Presbyterian women, they used to be uh, helped a lot with the, the publication, uh, not the publication of it, but the distribution and selling and getting the subscriptions for the Concern and the mm -hmm. Horizon and all right. our different books that we had. I used to ask the National, at the ladies' meeting when we go to Purdue, I used to 
At one time, I went to Purdue every year. I hadn't been since to the national meeting since 1988. Okay. But I, I, from the first meeting we had was at Maysville, Tennessee. And uh, I didn't go there but for about eight or 10 years every year after that when we started having them. Every year and every two years like that, I used to always try to get to the meeting, get other people, encourage other people to go and to read out. Princeton Women's Magazine. Mm -hmm. I still do. Um, do you have any thoughts about the the transition from um, Catawba Presbytery as an all black governing body into the post nineteen eighty three having just geographic presbyteries and fully integrated presbyteries? Well, that's what you call progress. You know, you don't stop progress. You've done that so long, it's, that's the next level. You miss a lot that you leave behind, but you don't want to miss your present blessings because you hold it on to the past. I've heard, I have the same question about mid councils for a lot of different people. And I've heard yeah. varying opinions. Yeah, you so get it. You'd miss a whole lot of good things that's coming to you in the future by holding on. By holding on this to the past too this, hard. Yeah, this too shall pass, so enjoy it while they're passing and go on to the next level. Uh -huh. It's not going to be the same because you, you don't always have the same people. Okay. Um, now that we've entered the realm of philosophy, <laughs> do you have do you have any um, special pieces of advice for the youth of Black Caucus for the youth of the Presbyterian Church? That's a deep subject, and it's a, I think there's a great need. I think there's a whole lot. I really feel like, and I shouldn't say it because I'm not there. I mean, I'm just speaking my personal opinions about these things because there's things going on. That, I don't really know about, but seemingly the training that we got, that I got, and the other my children got as Presbyterians, I don't see that same training being now. In what Every, sense? Well, uh, people used to always send their children to church camps, ghost ranch. I don't hear anybody going to ghost ranching. Uh, whoever's place in North, in New York, we always at my. First of church, we always sit. Uh, Did you send people to Stony Point? Stony Point, Stony Point, yes. My son-in-law would fill up his van and take the crowd for a week to New York. With kids? With, with children, children under 18. Oh, okay. We saw the kids children in the church, the one that come to Sunday school every Sunday, the ones that was in the youth choir and all. They either went to Stony Point, Ghost Ranch, uh, some place and they were wanting the people to I remember one year we had so many to want to go some of them went on the van and others were going and they, the, the, the restriction was that they couldn't go I think there was supposed to be senior in high school or something like that mm -hmm. and I had children that one that was, had tears in their eyes wanting to go we had worked and scrambled and gotten the money and I got a notice from the lady that was running the place in Stony Point said if I sent them and they went Qualify that when that age. It's, I took sent them anyway. And I got complimented for sending them. They said they were well behaved and they smart. And, and they are still in the Presbyterian Church. Mm. So the experience of going to yeah. a camp as a youth yeah. was formative. Whatever, whatever, you know, we had the youth conferences. They still might be having them, but I don't see the people in my area around getting the training that they once did. Yeah. Like I said, you asked about the interest of jail. The training is there and it's always, I call it ism, but it's always there. The ism is always with you. Oh yeah, you, there's some things that, if you're born with it and, and it's the right thing, you can always, it'll always be there. That sounds like a good place to end for now. Well. Thank you for your time, Karine. Yeah. I hope this is not the last time we get to speak. Well, yeah. 
I do it there, keep it. I like a good conversation. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you.